Welcome to the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, a weekly look at the latest news in Louisiana agriculture. Coming up, we'll have a look at this week's Louisiana Ag News headlines. We'll look inside the markets with commentary from experts at the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. We'll check out the latest happenings at the state capitol and in Washington, D.C. in our grassroots government segment. And we'll hear from one of you as we take you to the fields and pastures of the Bayou State and find out the latest in crop and cattle conditions. All of this and more coming up on this week's podcast. Now, here's the host of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, Kerry Martin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. I'm your host, Kerry Martin, and we've got a great podcast lined up for you today. We kick it all off with news headlines where we'll talk to Senator John Kennedy about a letter that he wrote to President Trump this week dealing with Chinese crawfish. We'll talk markets with Greg Fox and Mark Tall of the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. They'll discuss grain and rice markets. Plus, we'll talk about the cattle market with Dave Foster. Dave is the former head of market news at the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry, currently CEO of Cattle Producers of Louisiana. Dave will be talking to us from Natchitoches, where they're hosting Superior Livestock's Gulf Coast Classic Sale this weekend. And Dave will give us a market report from that sale. In our grassroots government segment, we go to the state capitol to talk with Joe Mapes. Joe is a lobbyist for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. He'll update us on everything happening in the state legislature right now. Then we'll go to the field to talk with one of you. We'll talk to Christian Richard. He is a rice, soybean, and crawfish producer in Vermilion Parish. He'll give us an update on what's happening on his farm here with all this crazy spring weather. And we'll talk with Christian about some very special awards that he has won over the last few months. Great to see a hard-working Louisiana farmer be recognized for his efforts. We'll visit with Christian about that in the field. All of that coming up and more. We kick it off now on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Here's a look at the latest news headlines in Louisiana agriculture on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. The 2018 Farm Bill is now making its way through Congress. The House Agriculture Committee passed it on Wednesday, moving it to the full House. Louisiana Congressman Ralph Abraham sits on the House Ag Committee. He says this is a very good bill for Louisiana farmers. We're going to bring cotton back in the fold, uh, back to our PLC. Here before it was in the stack program, that didn't work too well. Uh, talking to our bean, corn, rice, sugar farmers, they are uh, very pleased with what's in this 2018 farm bill. So I think Chairman Conway and the committee have done a very good job of uh, making most people very happy. And Abraham says this farm bill is actually ahead of schedule. For the last three years, we've been working fervently to get this on time, on target, and I really think we're going to actually be a little early. So that's a uh, phenomenal uh, thing to do up here in D.C. House Agriculture Committee Chairman Mike Conway of Texas says the bill should be called for a House vote in early May. Cold temperatures and frequent rains across Louisiana are slowing down the planting of the 2018 sorghum and soybean crops. The latest Louisiana Crop Progress and Condition Report shows both crops falling behind the five-year average pace. As of Monday, soybeans were 16% planted, slightly behind the 18% five-year average. The sorghum crop now 35% planted. That's quite a bit behind the 49% five-year average. Now, as far as corn and rice are concerned, both of those crops just about done. 97% of the corn crop in the ground, 87% of the rice crop planted. Looking at sugarcane crop ratings, 9% is rated excellent, 35% good, 50% rated fair, with 6% rated poor. Louisiana cotton producers are anxious to get their seed in the ground. Don Molino has that story. LSU Ag Center Extension Service cotton specialist Dr. Dan Frommy at the Deanley Research Station just south of Alexandria reports planting is just getting underway in some parts of Louisiana. We've had some cotton 
that has been planted earlier this week. Probably uh, as we speak, there's some cotton being planted, and I think there was a little bit in the state the week before last. But uh, as far as really going full gear, if we avoid the rain this coming weekend, next week, I believe there's going to be a lot of cotton that's going to start to be planted at this time. Of course, all the rain that we've had in uh, March and uh, early April, you know, soil moisture is, is excellent across the state. We've had some cool weather. Relatively speaking, you know, the soil temperatures are a little bit on the cool side, but when you look at the forecast next week, I think we're going to have some excellent planting conditions. Other than that, probably anticipating 170, possibly 190,000 acres of cotton this year. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully we'll have that much or, or more. I'm Don Molino on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. A very cold winter has had a chilling effect on Louisiana crawfish this year. Crawfish did not grow during December, January, so they missed probably three or four, maybe five molts. That's Mark Shirley with the LSU Ag Center. He says warmer temperatures have improved the quality of crawfish now on the market. Louisiana crawfish farmer Alan McLean Jr. We've been very fortunate. Our catch has been pretty consistent. With the warmer weather that we've had the past couple weeks, the uh, catch has really increased. The size is getting very good. McLean says now that the Lenten season is over, consumers should be seeing lower prices and a fresher product. Now that the huge demand for crawfish is over with Lent, the price should come down a little bit. We'll catch it today and it'll be in buyer's hands by this afternoon in some restaurants tonight and if others tomorrow morning. China up the ante this week in President Trump's effort to get a better balance of trade for the United States. This time China proposed tariffs on imported U.S. sorghum, another crop that we grow here in Louisiana. Louisiana Senator John Kennedy proposed this week that we add Chinese crawfish and shrimp to the list of possible tariffs that we impose on China. Senator Kennedy joins us here on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. And, Senator, this trade talk is making a lot of Louisiana farmers very nervous. Look, I I believe in free trade. Now, the trade has to be fair. I don't want America to get into a trade war. The only way to win a trade war is not to fight it. I think the president's doing the right thing in calling China's hand. China has been cheating since the day after it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. China does not open uh, its country to other people to do business, and when they do let you in, they they uh, steal your intellectual property, and that's got to got to stop. Having said that, um, I don't think the president's going to start a trade war. I, I don't. I think he's just trading. Uh, other countries hard to try to give us better deals. Senator, I know you sent a letter to President Trump this week asking for possible import tariffs on Chinese crawfish and shrimp. Tell me about that letter. The letter I sent to the president regarding Chinese crawfish, what my letter says is, look, if you do decide to impose tariffs, and I'm not encouraging you to impose those tariffs, But if you do decide to impose tariffs, um, uh, please consider increasing the tariff on uh, on Chinese crawfish. Uh, The the Chinese product is inferior. China dumps it on American markets and other markets, too, at way below market rates. Sanitation is another issue. And, And my point to the president was, look, I'm not telling you to start a trade war. I don't want you to start a trade war. I'm not telling you to impose all these tariffs, but if you're going to do it, uh, then then uh, you certainly ought to consider doing it on Chinese crawfish. Well, Senator, all of this trade war talk, I know, has Louisiana farmers very nervous. China threatening to put tariffs on soybeans and sorghum, both crops we grow here in Louisiana. What would be your message to Louisiana farmers as we move through this process? Because, of course, when you talk about a possible trade war, you're dealing with their livelihoods. Let me say it again. I I do not think we should have a trade war. Um, Nobody wins in a trade war. Uh, we've already seen the impact of uh, of this on commodity prices. They're falling through the floor in many cases. But I do not think, if I'm wrong later, I will admit it, but I do not think the president intends to start a trade war. I think he uh, he's trying to get us a, a better deal with uh, uh, in terms of trade with other countries, including but not limited to China. Senator John Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us here on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. 
Thanks, Kerry. Good to talk to you, man. That is a look at some of the latest news headlines in Louisiana agriculture. Of course, remember, you can find all of the latest Louisiana agriculture news on our website, voiceoflouisianaagriculture.org or voiceoflaag.org. We update it every weekday with the latest news in Louisiana agriculture. You can also find the latest videos from This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, our 30-minute television show that we do every week. Also, so while you're on the site, be sure to subscribe to our daily e-newsletter. It's called The Daily Voice, and it has all of the latest Louisiana ag news delivered to your inbox each weekday morning at 5 a.m. You can click the button right there on the home page of our website and subscribe to our daily e-newsletter. Coming up next, it's time to look at the markets. We'll look at both the grain and livestock markets with Greg Fox and Dave Foster on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This is Trace Atkins for Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. You know your Louisiana Farm Bureau membership gives you access to the best insurance on the planet, but it can also save you hundreds when you buy a car. On vacation, your Louisiana Farm Bureau membership gets you discounts on hotels and rental cars, and it makes you part of a group that's 143,000 families strong. So go to LAFarmBureau.org or call your parish Farm Bureau office to become a member. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. Now let's look at the markets with insight from the experts at the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. And to take a look at the markets, we talk with Greg Fox. He's a grain marketing specialist with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. Greg, let's look at these grain markets. You know, the last couple of days we've seen the markets seem to drift lower really all week. They've been fairly weak, and it almost seems like it's not a matter of what's going on in the market. It's really a matter of the fact that there's just really nothing going on in these markets right now. That's a good chunk of it. It's, it's just real flat and this week, um, kind of watch and waiting. The Midwest is, you know, corn planting. Um, they're a little bit behind, but not to where people are concerned yet. You know, they can plant a lot in a short window, so the concern, you know, they're not concerned with that. Um, the Milo tariff talk um, came out, but we didn't see a big dive in the market when it hit. I think folks are trying to break it down and see how how the impact's going to be overall. You know, China's done buying old crop Milo, so this would hit new crop Milo, which when are they going to jump in that market and try to buy some? So it's just been really quiet, a lot of weather watching and a lot of field watching, a lot of field work watching to see what's going into the ground. Greg, you mentioned that Chinese uh, Milo tariff. They announced earlier this week that they were putting a tariff or an import fee or something on imported U.S. sorghum. Uh, what do you make of that? You know, last week you and I talked about the soybean tariff. You felt like it really wasn't that big a deal. Do you think this is going to turn out to be the same thing? Uh, this one might have a little bit more teeth in it than the bean tariff. You know, at some point we talked about they're going to have to buy U.S. beans regardless. They just can't get the, all their bean needs from somebody else. Now, when it comes to Milo, they might be able to fulfill those needs someplace else. I think U.S. Milo was typically cheaper, readily available, quality was where they wanted. Um, so I think, you know, they, they were able to get what they wanted out of the U.S. Um, with the Milo, they might be able to wait a lot longer to jump into that market to buy it than they can soybeans. Also, Milo is typically a feed commodity. So they got a lot of corn reserve that they want their internal market to use up before they start bringing in other substitutes. So this could be where they're trying to force their market, their internal market to use up those corn reserves and get that out of the way instead of relying on outside uh, sources. Greg, let's talk about these markets specifically, soybeans. Last week we saw a good, slow, steady climb. This past week, uh, not so much. Uh, what are you seeing in soybeans there? Are we looking at uh, any South American issues, any weather issues to talk about? Everybody's still watching Argentina. Um, of course, you know, they're just the talk is going to be, you know, how much more reduction in their overall production are we going to see? Kind of watching and waiting there. So the markets just feel like they're on hold and getting through a, a somewhat lackluster week. 
and seeing if next week's going to give us any any big news. You know, we did trade up into the 1050 range. We never could quite hold it. I think 1030 could be a decent support level for us. You know, we're in the 1030s now, um, but there's still some strength in these markets. We just need the news to hit and kind of go our way. But short term, I, I think we're just supportive of where we are. The corn market still uh, well below four dollars. Not a lot of support there, even though we still keep talking about the weather in the Midwest and possible planting delays. Yeah, I mean they're not behind where people are concerned. You know, five percent is the five-year average. Then they're roughly three percent planted uh, as of Monday. So, you know, they get a window of opportunity once the snow melts and um, if they have to do any land prep. You know, they can plant a lot of acres in a short window. So. They can make up for those delays fairly quickly. It's going to be, are we going to continue to see these long-term delays, and will some of those areas end up going into beans like we've seen in years past where some some idle acres either went back into bean rotation or or not or stayed idle? But um, that's a question mark there. Corn, we're just sitting on a ton of corn. Corn stocks are still strong, and then you look at the acres that are projected to be planted. You know, that still puts us very comfortable on corn acres. We need... We need exports to jump in and just start buying the corn up and feedlots to start using it. We need to see that demand pick up, and we need to see the supply shrink, and I think that would help our corn prices really take off. Greg Fox, he's a grain marketing specialist with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. Greg, thanks for joining us on the Voice in Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Thank you. Now a quick rundown on how the markets wrapped up on Friday. May soybeans down 8 and a half, 10, 28 and 3 quarters. November beans down 7 and a half. 1035. May corn was down five and a half, 376 and a half. September corn down five and a half, 393. July wheat down 13 and a half, closing at 477 and a quarter. Rough rice closed lower. May down nine cents, 1299. September rice down seven and a half, 1216 and a half. The cotton market moved higher with old crop May jumping 250 points to close at 8547, new crop December cotton up 84, 7943. July sugar unchanged, finishing the week at 24.95 cents. Now let's switch gears and talk about the cattle market. And to do that, we go to Natchitoches, Louisiana, where we talk with Dave Foster. Dave is CEO of Cattle Producers of Louisiana. And Dave, I know you're up in Natchitoches today. We've got a really big sale going on. The Superior Livestock Gulf Coast Classic. Tell me a little bit about that. What's going on up there? Well, this is the third year that... uh Superior has uh, hosted it here in Natchitoches, and uh, that's quite a straw in the cap of us for uh, Louisiana cattle business people because, you know, we don't get a lot of recognition, it seems like, so to have something as big as this. Rayburn Smith is a head rep here with others helping him, but, uh, Kerry, i got to tell you, we've got right at 10,000 Louisiana cattle consigned today, both the ryegrass calves, heavy feeders coming out of off of ryegrass, and then the calves will start selling this afternoon. It's quite an accomplishment, and they've sold the heavy steers and heifers. Uh, this, this morning just got done with those, and they are certainly bringing market price. The only real difference is uh, between the Texas and the Kansas cattle really is freight, so we're pretty proud of that. Dave, let's talk about the feeder cattle market here in Louisiana. So far this year, you know, of course, cattlemen have dealt with a tough winter and spring, just like everyone else. What's your take on the market right now here in Louisiana? Well, so far, you know, we started out really halfway decent, and then uh, uh, the market kind of got a little bit tough, and then it picked back up really for a while there, and uh, the thing that has hurt us, I guess, uh, really, uh, it's been a blessing and a curse. The one thing is the market, with all these winter storms moving through that wheat pasture country, uh, a lot of those cattle that would have been on wheat, they went into the feedlots, so again, uh, heavy cattle were under pressure, but um, again, with the, with the cattle that we have here, our lightweight cattle aren't coming to market yet. They'll, they'll start in another month or two. And so uh, we really kind of dodged a bullet, so to speak. And I've noticed here this morning, this, this is kind of is going to tell a story, Kerry, that cattle, let's say uh, seven weight steers and heifers for current delivery this month and the first part of May, the difference between those prices and cattle weighing that same weight coming out in uh, oh, June and July those later calves coming out in June and July are probably five to six dollars a hundred stronger, higher priced. 
what that basically is, those feedlots have just now started to market those uh, cattle calves that were placed in the fall, and so they're just full is what it amounts to. But we're in a great position, I think, uh, because, again, our, our fall-born calves will start coming in, oh, late May, June, July time frame. Uh, our spring-born calves will start coming in August, September, some into October, and that's just the right time for those to go either to a grass steel or, or kind of a background and thing. So I think the market for us looks good with a lighter weight cattle. When I'm talking lighter weight cattle, carry it's mostly under 600 pounds at 650 pounds or less. Uh, so I think we're in better shape than most. Dave Foster, he is CEO of Cattle Producers of Louisiana. We're talking to him from Natchitoches at the Superior Livestock's Gulf Coast Classic Sale. Dave, thanks for joining us on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. All right, Kerry. Now let's take a quick look at our Louisiana livestock auction prices this week. First on Monday, Kinder Livestock Auction sold two to three weight steers from a dollar fifty-five to two twenty a pound. Three to four weight steers, a dollar forty to a dollar ninety. Four to five hundred pounders, a dollar thirty to a dollar seventy-five. Five to six weight steers, a dollar twenty-five to a dollar sixty a pound. Six to seven weight steers, a dollar twenty to a dollar forty-five. Bred cows brought five hundred dollars to sixteen hundred. A head cow calf pairs seven hundred to two thousand a pair. On Wednesday, the Red River Livestock Auction in Cushata sold two to three weight steers from a dollar forty to two oh five a pound. Three to four hundred pounders a dollar thirty nine to two dollars. Four to five weight steers brought a dollar forty to a dollar ninety seven. Five to six weight steers a dollar twenty eight to a dollar sixty six. Six to seven hundred pounders a dollar nineteen to a dollar sixty a pound. Cows range from a low of three hundred to a high of thirteen hundred a head. Cow calf pairs brought five hundred to fourteen. 1500 a pair. And that is a look at markets. Time to switch gears and go to the halls of government in our grassroots government segment. We'll take you to the state capitol to talk to Joe Mates. That's coming up next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Farm Bureau has been working for Louisiana's farmers and ranchers since 1922, and that work continues today. If you're a farmer or rancher, Farm Bureau wants you to join and be a part of their family. Farm Bureau knows you're busy running your operation, so while you're at work on your farm or ranch, Farm Bureau is watching out for your interests. So join today. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. It's time for a look inside the halls of government in this week's edition of Grassroots Government on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Joe Mapes is a lobbyist for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. He joins us on this week's Grassroots Government segment. And Joe, let's talk about a few bills that have been debated in the Louisiana legislature so far this session. Let's start out with a bill that was uh, the headline story in our Daily Voice e-newsletter this morning. And that is a bill that dealt with private property rights. It would have allowed fishermen to cross onto private property as long as water was flowing over that property and they could navigate on that water. Tell me a little bit about that bill. I know that it did go down to defeat, but what was that bill all about? It was a very, very contentious issue at the state capitol this session. Uh, it sure was, Gary. It's an issue as far as Farm Bureau is concerned regarding property rights. As you were saying, the bill was actually titled navigable waters had something to do with navigable waters and the bill was related to contiguous parishes parishes that were contiguous to the uh, gulf of mexico and uh riparian parishes that we as we know them in agriculture the bill said that if water came across a private property owner's property then that was now navigable and uh, became waters of the state and the bill would basically redefine what navigable waters is by saying if you can get a boat and a motor in it, it's navigable. 
So it's a big problem for our property owners, as you might imagine. And it was very emotional down there at the Capitol. In the end, Joe, that bill did end up going down to defeat, right? It did. It came out of committee, which was a surprise to a lot of people. It came out of the uh, committee of origin, the House Civil Law Committee. Then it came up on the House floor this past Monday. It was a long, drawn-out battle, uh, several hours. And yes, the bill finally was defeated there. The author of the bill, bill vowed to come back with legislation next next year to resolve this. But also, uh, everybody interested parties like Farm Bureau have also have vowed to work with uh, the promoters of the bill in the interim so that we don't have to come back here in a in a. Uh, a session next year. Hey, Joe, let's talk about the milk issues in the state capitol. Of course, uh, I grew up on a dairy. I'm a dairy guy myself, uh, drink a lot of milk, and I know that milk issues have been discussed. Uh, first off, pricing on milk was one issue that was talked about. Uh, where has that bill gone this session? Well, the original bill that would have allowed for discount pricing at the retail level of milk and milk products, that bill was killed A second bill by that original author, the same author, uh, was filed. And what it does, Kerry, is it sets up a dairy stabilization board study committee. And it's going to look at the current structure and look at possible uh, new structures. The good news is three uh, dairymen from Farm Bureau will will serve on that that study committee. I know another bill that you talked a lot about, Joe, would increase the permit violation fees for an ag transportation permit. Tell me about that bill. Where are we at on it? Yeah, that came at us uh, out of left field, Kerry. But currently, the, the the fine if you if you misuse a harvest season permit, which I like to call an ag tag. Uh, you know, if you misuse it in any way, trying to haul it for commercial gain outside of the agricultural use that it's permitted for, uh, the current fine is zero dollars. This bill would have increased that fine to two thousand five hundred dollars. It came out of nowhere, did not come from the Department uh, of Transportation. Uh, we, we talked to the author of the bill. The author of the bill was not aware of the contents in the bill. He was asked to file a bill. The good news is we killed the bill, Gary, and that bill's dead for this session. There is another bill on truck permitting. I don't know if uh, permit fees, I don't know if you were uh, planning on talking to me about that, but that comes up next week. The, chairman of, the new chairman of House Transportation has it, and this would retool the entire truck permitting schedule that DOTD now has. And we tried to do this for one year in a task force, you, uh, I'm sure you recall, and with DOTD and probably about 20 or 30 other interested, interested parties sitting around the table for one year, and we got nowhere. I can't imagine that we'll be able to get anywhere in this compressed amount of time with this contentious atmosphere. So we'll see where that what, where that goes. But we're going to oppose that, I'm sure. Any other agricultural bills uh, coming up here over the next week, Joe, to talk about? Um, you know, right now, Terry, the, what we were fighting for with the commissioner uh, of, of agriculture on the floor yesterday before we went home for the weekend, thank goodness. He's looking at a 23% cut in that budget that, uh, that you know, yesterday afternoon. And uh, that was all the LAFA money, the Agricultural Finance Authority money. So this is not the end. It's a long way between now and, and, and the end. And we may not even resolve a budget in this session. We may go into a special session. But for right now, we've done well. We've, we've killed some bills on water aquifers and, and water commissions. And so we're ahead of the game right now, Kerry. It just passed halfway through the session. I know the governor has been calling to try to wrap this session up early so that we can deal with budget issues in a special session. What's the status of that? What's the thought there at the Capitol on that? Well, you know, they're looking at around May 18th now, and the Republicans have said uh, so far that they weren't interested in a special session at all, that they wanted to resolve any, everything in a regular. But just lately, as uh, as they were passing this budget on the floor yesterday, there's there's talk that they may consider ending early and going into a special. So we're closer to that than we were even a week ago, I can promise you. We're probably about 20 or 30 percent closer. So we're, hopefully we're getting there to where we get some consensus as to what we want to do and how we want to do it with the budget. Joe Mapes, he's a lobbyist for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Joe, thanks for joining us on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kerry. Have a good weekend. Coming up next, we go in the field to talk with Christian Richard, a rice, soybean, and crawfish producer in Vermilion Parish. That's coming up right after this on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast.
This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Louisiana farmers and ranchers dedicate their lives to producing the food we eat and the clothes we wear. Agriculture touches all of us every time we sit down at the table. So support Louisiana agriculture by joining Farm Bureau. And you don't have to be a farmer to join. If you're already a member, we thank you. Your membership supports farmers and ranchers right here in your local community. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. taking you to the fields of Louisiana as we hear from one of you in the field on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. We go to the field to talk with Christian Richard. He is a rice, crawfish, and soybean producer in Vermilion Parish. Christian, thanks for joining us on the podcast this week. Yeah, Carrie, thanks for having me. Well, Christian, let's talk about some things that have happened to you, I guess, during the winter over the last few months. You were recognized with some really special awards. First, you were named Rice Farmer of the Year by Rice Farming Magazine. Congratulations on that. Give me your thoughts. Yeah, it was very, very uh, humbling uh, experience, and after looking at the list of recipients over the in, in the past louisiana has been well represented and it was truly an honor for the industry to select me and and my wife and my family and um i, I was really honored to, to be recognized a funny story i remember you telling back when that happened was that you you just thought it was a joke <laughs> yeah the, the tim walker with horizon ag you know I, we, we went through uh rice leadership class together and we really became really good friends and and when he had called it, it you know, I thought it was just a prank that he was pulling on me, and I, I sure didn't think he was serious. But you know, after after the the conver- after about five minutes into the conversation, I, I guess I I started to realize, well, maybe there's something to this. So um, yeah, no, it was it was a real big surprise and a, and a big honor. And uh, you know, definitely again, like to thank Rice Farming Magazine and and Horizon Ag and everyone who sponsored the award. Christian, you won another award. You were recognized uh, a few months ago by uh, Field to Market the Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture as its Farmer Spotlight honoree for your commitment to conservation and stewardship. Just yet another uh, award, another way to say thanks for the hard work you do on the farm. You know, that one, I wouldn't really call it an award, you know, maybe just a little bit of recognition, but it's kind of a, a mislabeling, I guess you could say, because as farmers, we're all the ultimate conservationists and and we all do in our own regard what's best for the for the ground that we're that we're raising our crops and our families on. So I mean, I don't think that it's anything out the ordinary. We just do what we have to do to survive and 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 leave the ground and and leave the earth better than what it was before we got it. Christian, let's take a look at your 2018 crop. Tell me a little bit about your crop mix. How many acres do you have in uh, this year in rice? How many acres are in crawfish production and anything else you may have going on your farm? Give me a rundown on that. Uh, this year we probably have about uh 2000 acres uh of rice and eight eight or nine hundred acres of crawfish and about a thousand twelve hundred acres of soybeans well let's first talk about the rice crop christian i know it's been a challenging spring uh rice got off to you know an average start cold weather kind of backed us up a little bit and then you, we had a good window to plant quite a few acres um three dry weeks which really helped a lot and then rice was growing and then we've had these last seems like every weekend it rains or and it gets cold so uh, it's really, really slowed it down quite a bit in the last couple of weeks, but but it looks good. We have good stands. You know, hopefully the sun starts shining a little more and, and we get a little more heat units out there. Well, Christian, are you trying any new varieties this year in your rice fields or sticking with the, you know, the old tried and true mix? We, we are trying about 300 acres of the new uh, Provisio system, which is um, a different mode of uh, action against uh, red rice. And about 15 percent of the crop is, is planted in Provisio. Um, the remainder is, is a mix of hybrids and uh, clear field lines from Horizon Ag. I think we have one field of, of medium grain, but that's, that's about it. I mean, it's just pretty much the st- standard aside from the introduction of Provisio on a large scale. Tell me how the crawfish have been looking in this cold spring, Christian. Um, the crawfish, as, as everyone's well aware, one of the coldest winters we've had in a long time, and, and it really delayed the crawfish emerging. And, and once they started to emerge and we started trapping, we had a few weeks of, of really overcast days, a lot of fog, very, very poor conditions for survival. We had a lot of uh, mortality coming out of the ponds. I mean, you had, you had a lot of crawfish that were dying before they even get back to the docks. Um, so we had a lot of problems with that. And then... Once Lent started, it seemed like everything kind of started to come around. 
um, catch started to improve, size got better, and and now you know we're in the in the heart of the season, and um, we're you know we're, we're catching pretty good. Uh, these cool snaps are making a molt, so the size seems to be getting better. Uh, you know, almost almost weekly. So, uh, as crawfish seem to be pretty good um, for the consumer. It's really good news because uh, the prices seem to be a little lower than what they've been um, in previous years at this point. Um, because when the crawfish finally decided to to come out of the holes, they they really made a move. Christian, I know that uh, you actually have a, a branded product in some stores, uh, Richard Farms Crawfish. Uh, how long have you been doing that? And tell me how that came about. The label and the brand just started last year, but we've been peeling and, and just selling out of out of our shop just to some of the locals and with with some of the some of the trips and some of the groups that we've met with in the past. You know, it's, it's field to market or field to table has, has been a huge a huge hit and people want to know where their food comes from and they there's a there's a big value in having that label on there that says that it comes from Kaplan, louisiana they know the people that they're buying it from and it's a it's a good product um they they know they know exactly what they're getting and they they can they can drive by the ponds and see where their crawfish that they're eating that night where it's coming from so you know it's a it's a big plus um we're not doing it on a, a terribly large scale but it is enough to help move some of the uh some of the crawfish earlier on in the week so, um, you know, and, and like I say, the community, the local community has been really good. And we've got some um, restaurants in Lafayette that are starting to serve it. So my wife, Julie, has been really on the road kind of kind of hustling this stuff. And she's really done a good job with it. Christian, it's been such a challenging year uh, with everything, as you've already mentioned, crawfish and, and trying to get the rice crop in the ground. Um, how are things looking as far as getting the beans in the ground? Uh, are you anticipating having any problems there? Are you behind schedule on anything yet? No, we're we're pretty much on schedule. Um, I mean, I still actually have about 200 acres of rice left to plant, which we will probably plant tomorrow, Saturday. But uh, as far as the beans are concerned, you know, you we, we really need to look for a, a good seven to ten day window of, of putting them in. Because, I mean, we could have planted at any point in the last couple of weeks. But, you know, looking looking into the future and seeing an inch or two of rain, three inches of rain uh, is, is pretty much a recipe for disaster with beans. So, you know, we need a we just need a good window. And, and it's been challenging the last couple of years. So I think we're due one. So. Well, Christian, thanks for joining us here on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Kerry, thanks for having me. In the field with Christian Richard down in Vermilion Parish near Kaplan. Coming up next, we'll put the wraps on this week's podcast. We'll look at all the events coming up on the ag calendar right here on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Believe it or not, your food doesn't come from the grocery store. It just may have been grown on a farm right here in Louisiana. And those jeans you're wearing may have come from a Louisiana cotton farm. Louisiana's farmers and ranchers take pride in producing the food and fiber that we all use in our daily lives. So each time you sit down to a meal or get dressed for the day, thank a Louisiana farmer or rancher. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. Now to wrap up this week's podcast, let's take a look at what's coming up this week on the Louisiana Ag Calendar. Only one event to talk about on the Louisiana Ag Calendar this week, and that is the Northwest Louisiana Beef and Forage Field Day. It's coming up on Thursday, April 26th. 8.30 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon at the LSU Ag Center's Hill Farm Research Station. That's just outside of Homer in Claiborne Parish. It's a free event, and they'll have lunch provided and a great lineup of speakers. Topics to be discussed include calving problems, bull selection and management, weed control, using legumes in pastures, an update on the Louisiana Master Farmer Program, and a cattle market update by an old friend of mine, Dr. Daryl Peel. He's a livestock marketing specialist at Oklahoma State University. Dr. Peel will be there to give his insight on the current cattle market. So a great lineup, a great program plan. 
planned coming up this Thursday, Northwest Beef and Forage Field Day at the LSU Ag Center's Hill Farm Research Station in Homer. Well, that puts the wraps on this edition of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Thanks for joining us. And be sure to tune in again next week. In the meantime, connect with us online, our website, voiceoflaag.org. And be sure to subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Daily Voice. And connect with us on social media. On Facebook, we're at Voice of LA Ag. On Twitter, same handle, Voice of LA Ag. We keep both of those social media accounts updated daily with the latest news and information in Louisiana agriculture. Thanks a lot for joining us. We'll see you again right here next week. Thanks for listening to the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Join us again next week. This podcast is produced by Kerry Martin and the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. For more information, be sure to check out our website, voiceoflouisianaagriculture.org and lafarmbureau.org.